Now, let's, uh, let's begin the actual debate. So the format of the debate, uh, Mr. Jackson will uh, present the affirmative opening speech. Uh, the topic that we're debating is resolved that Woodward should rescind its mandatory random drug testing program for upper school students. Uh, Mr. Jackson will be given an opportunity to give an opening statement, and Dr. Gully will be given an opportunity to give the opening negative statement. At that point, we'll have a discussion, and we'll be taking questions from you all uh, via the Today's Meet electronic um, method. Uh, and then at 1.10, we'll cut off those questions, and we'll give each speaker an opportunity to give a brief closing statement. Uh, so during the debate, please be quiet, please be respectful, uh, and like we said before, if you have questions, we strongly encourage them. Uh, use today's meet on your uh, cell phone. So, Mr. Jackson, uh, representing the affirmative, please present your opening statement. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Batterman. <clears throat> the Supreme Court has determined that schools have the constitutional right to randomly drug test students. Nonetheless, having the right does not make it right. And it is this that is the crux of the debate today. Dr. Gully has argued that Ward Academy's mandatory random drug testing policy is part of a larger comprehensive drug education program. As Dr. Gully stated in his initial announcement, quote, the aim of this program is to prevent drug and alcohol use. We are convinced that the knowledge of possible testing by Woodward would encourage many students to say no when presented with an opportunity to use drugs or drink alcohol, end quote. I concede that Dr. Gully's stated goals are noble. However, the process by which Ward Academy seeks to achieve those goals is fatally flawed. Ward Academy should abandon this policy for a number of reasons. First, the best scientific studies conclusively prove that mandatory random drug testing does not decrease drug use. The first large-scale national study on student drug testing conducted by researchers at the University of Michigan and a National Institute on Drug Abuse found no difference in rates of drug use between those schools that have drug testing programs and those schools that do not. Based on data from 76,000 students nationwide, the study found that drug testing does not have an impact on illicit drug use or belief about the dangers of drugs. In 2006, the research at the University of Michigan conducted a more extensive study with an enlarged sample of schools. The updated results agree with the previous study. There is no impact correlation between mandatory random drug testing policies and the reduction of illicit drug use. Thus, in short, social science disproves Dr. Gully's stated policy goal. As a result, Woodward Academy should abandon the policy. Science and not personal anecdotes should be the basis of our health policies here at Woodward Academy. Second, the consensus of experts agree that drug testing is ineffectual. Physicians, social workers, substance abuse treatment providers, and child advocates speak on one accord in their condemnation of the efficacy of a mandatory random drug testing program. They agree with science. Random drug testing does not deter illicit drug use. Prominent national organizations that oppose drug testing pr programs include the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Education Association, the Association, the American Public Health Association, the National Association of Social Workers, the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, and Mr. Jackson. <laughs> All of these groups have testified that drug testing causes students to shift their drug use to alcohol, tobacco, LSD, inhalants, hallucinogens, and other drugs that do not break the brain-blood barrier. Thus, implementation of the Water Academy policy incentivizes students to turn to more dangerous drugs that leave the body quickly, to turn to those that are not tested or those that cannot be tested, and to turn to binge drinking. This will lead to an even greater health and public safety risk. Dr. Gully has previously argued that the policy gives the students an out, a way to resist peer pressure. I can't take a hit on this joint because we're Academy tests. In reality, the policy only gives students a reason to say no to specific drugs, namely only those that Woodward Academy tests. 
and they do so for the wrong reason. Instead of challenging peer pressure and aggressively rejecting invitations to experiment with drugs at all, students are taught to make excuses and to apologize to their peers for not going along with the program. The reasons students say no matters. If students learn to say no only to the specific drugs and for the wrong reason, then they will be less able to say no to other drugs, especially alcohol, and will leave Woodward unprepared to successfully counteract negative peer pressure. The best practices would dictate that education and empowering teens to make good choices about what to place inside of their bodies is better than threats of punishment and reprisals simply for disobeying the adults. A comprehensive drug and alcohol education policy alone is a better strategy to reduce illicit drug and alcohol abuse. Third, drug testing leads to teen oppositional behavior which only amplifies their illicit drug use. The American Academy of Pediatrics provides evidence that the majority of students perceive the test as adults' mistrust of teens. A P first, talk later mentality fosters mistrust and creates an artificial barrier to open discussions about illicit drug and alcohol use. This makes it less likely that students will report safety issues to any Woodward Academy employee or admit that they have a medical condition that needs addressing. In addition, this P first, talk later mentality leads to oppositional behavior to try to beat the system and to game the test. It seems like common sense that if students are warned that they could be tested, they'd be less likely to risk getting high in the first place. Well, let me tell you something. Common sense is the most uncommon of all of our senses. Adult common sense is not the same as teen common sense. Those two are not identical. It is at this crossroad that the adults in this matter have made their mistakes in supporting the Woodward Academy policy. Teens take risk. Teens experiment. That is their nature. Teens who take the risk to experiment with drugs already have more than a random chance of getting caught. The Water Academy policy breeds mistrust among non-drug using teens and ensnares no more teens than would have been caught otherwise, even without the policy. Intelligent Woodward Academy students who think about experimenting with drugs will simply change the nature of their experiment. Our efforts should be focused on strategies that improve the trust between students and parents and teachers and healthcare professionals. If you were a teen who had a medical condition, would you confide in the same people who would threaten to expel you if, you, if they had knowledge of your drug condition? Of course you wouldn't. The Warwick Academy community is not safer. It is more at risk. Eroded are the bonds of healthcare professional and student relationship. Eroded are the bonds of a student-teacher relationship. Eroded are the bonds of the counselor-student relationship. Eroded are the bonds of just about every adult a Warwick Academy student is likely to encounter on any given school day. Testing poisons the well replaced our feelings of anger, of resentment, of teen mistrust, of the same adults they should be confiding in. And all for what? No discernible benefit? All the gains that would have been obtained by a comprehensive drug and alcohol program, education program, solely are eroded once you introduce a specter of mandatory random drug testing. Comprehensive education, coupled with threats of punishment and reprisals, breeds contempt, not compliance. In conclusion, there is scant scientific evidence that mandatory random drug testing has a deterrent effect its proponents expound. The test may give proponents a false sense that they are doing all they can, that they are taking a stand against drugs. But the science proves that these policies will not have the desired deterrent effect. The best studies found that the drug testing will not prevent drug use. It will simply prompt drug abusers to switch their drug of choice. They will switch from X to Y. In short, 
Woodward's drug policy is supported by anecdotes, politics, and emotion. The substantive goals of drug reduction and eradication are noble, but the process by which it seeks to achieve these goals is ignominious. Having the right does not make it right. Woodward should have been this drug testing policy. Thank you very much for your attention. The decision for Woodward Academy to implement a mandatory random drug testing program was taken after very careful, thoughtful, and deliberate consideration, with the health, safety, and welfare of students being the primary factors driving the adoption of the policy. The focus of the policy is intended to help, not harm, to help, not harm, and to prevent, and not to punish. The decision was made after a year-long careful review by 18 members of this community, eight governing board members and eight members of the senior administration. It represented doctors, lawyers, educators, persons from the nonprofit world, persons who work in, the bus in business, and a DEA agent. After careful review of all of the information, including every argument that Mr. Jackson has put before you, this committee concluded that on balance that the right thing for Woodward and its students to assure student protection and health and good welfare was to adopt the policy that will be implemented in the fall of next year. Part of what drove the decision was the fact that we believe that we have a very comprehensive education program. When we examined what Woodward does to educate students on the use of drugs here, Compared to other institutions, we are persuaded that we have as effective a program as any that are out there. And yet, anecdotes persist about student drug use. I dare say that every one of you in this room can speak about one instance you have heard of and may know about personally of a Woodward student at some point in their Woodward High School career having engaged in drug use. A second thing that concerned us was the research that is undisputed about the impact of drug use in the teenage years. Teenagers do take risky behaviors. Part of that is due to the delayed maturation of the brain in the teenage years, which does not occur to be fully developed until the mid-20s. What the science shows is, is that drug use in the teenage years, even casually or recreationally, can impair brain development permanently. A study recently out of New Zealand suggested that persons who repeatedly use marijuana in the teenage years will experience a loss of IQ by the time they are 38 years of age. In addition to impairing brain development, the research is very clear that the longer that a person delays experimentation with drugs and alcohol, the less likely there is a chance for that person to develop addiction later on in life. A study recently published by Columbia University notes that there is a six times greater likelihood of addiction to substance abuse if a person experiments with drugs in the teenage years. As we began to look at other educational institutions around the country and what they were doing to address drug use in their communities, one of the things that captured our attention was the possibility of implementing a mandatory drug testing program. It is hard to know exactly how many schools in the United States, public and private, that implement these policies of drug testing. It, it would appear that approximately 15% of the high schools nationally have some form of a drug testing program. The problem with the science and the research that Mr. Jackson cited, which is fairly dated, going back to the late 1990s and 2006, is based on the same authors of those studies and at institutions that do not fit the profile of a school like Woodward. They are public institutions that have not universally administered a random drug testing program, and it is all based on self-reports of students and their drug use. The committee, in making its decision to implement this policy, was frankly underwhelmed by the science that is out there. But if you are looking for research that would help, 
in 2010, the United States Department of Education published a research program using the same criteria that the other science that Mr. Jackson has uh, cited for you, suggesting that the implementation of a mandatory drug testing program does indeed reduce the amount of drug use among teenagers, and it does have some effectiveness. So in looking at the in institutions that are like Woodward, that are private and are administering this program universally, we, we focused on four schools in particular that are doing this and seem to be doing it well with good results as presented by their students, the in administration of these institutions, and their parents. Bayside Academy in Mobile, Alabama, Talladega Academy in Talladega, Alabama, Montgomery Bell Academy in Nashville, Tennessee, and Wesleyan here in Atlanta are all institutions of the dozen that we looked at that we examined very closely and in fact invited two of those institutions to come to visit with us personally and the committee to share about their drug testing programs. They all reported a remarkably increased uh, reduction in the use of drug testing, at least from the anecdotes that they have from the students at those institutions. And the students with whom we spoke said that they appreciated the fact that their administration cared enough about them that they did indeed give them a legitimate reason to say no to the use of drugs when uh, presented by that opportunity with their peers. The committee concedes and I concede that this drug testing program is not going to help every student say no. We know that there will be some students who are going to find ways to get around the drug testing program and who are never going to be persuaded by any deterrent that is put out there. But based on what we knew and believed about Woodward students, we believe that the vast majority of you would be persuaded by having available to you another opportunity to say no to your peers beyond just saying that your parents oppose it, but to say that you are worried about the possibility of being tested yourself uh, for drug use, and that therefore gives you a good reason to say no to your peers. Finally, the uh, committee was persuaded that we, like it or not, are in a day and age of a drug testing culture. Any of you who are athletes that go to uh, Division I institutions upon graduation, 90% of the Division I uh, NCAA schools test their athletes. 65% of the Division II institutions test their athletes. 25% of the Division III institutions test their athletes. And if you were fortunate enough in any of those divisions to make it to postseason play, you would automatically be tested. So athletes, at least, will not be immune from testing once they get into college. But then if you look at what happens post-college when you are applying for a job, most Fortune 500 companies require at least pre-employment drug testing. Any, any uh, business related to health and safety is going to require a drug testing uh, of you, at least as a pre-employment uh, opportunity. And finally, there is great uh, encouragement from the insurance industry for institutions to reduce their employment, their uh, workers' compensation employment insurance by implementing mandatory random drug testing programs of their employees. Because we are implementing that here at Woodward, we will have a $10,000 reduction in what we have to pay to health insurance providers. The theory being that employers will save money because they will have healthier, more productive employees working in their organizations. So despite all of the evidence of what Mr. Jackson presented to you as reasons not to have this policy, the committee believed that when you weigh all of the evidence that is out there, the risk to brain development in the teenage years, the legitimate deterrent effect that is provided to, to students by being able to say no to peers when presented with the opportunity to take drugs is a reason why we believe that this policy is worthwhile and why I oppose the resolution that Mr. Jackson has presented to you. Thank you. start a little bit of a discussion. Uh, we'll start a little bit of a discussion here in a minute. If you are thinking of questions, um, go ahead and send them in on uh, today's meet. Uh, the URL is on the board, um, and we'll start taking those questions um, uh, momentarily. So let me start with you, Mr. Jackson. Yes. Uh, the, um, Dr. Gully appealed to a set of private schools 
um, that, they, that their committee studied in depth about uh, why their programs work. So Bayside, uh, Talladega, Montgomery Bell, Wesleyan. Um, what would you say uh, to the argument that uh, by asking those schools about their programs um, that we should model them and that they're a better fit than uh, maybe the public institutions that were studied uh, in uh, different studies? All right, well, I would have a, a couple responses to that. All right, first, those schools who say that their program works have a vested self-interest to declare their program a success. But declaring a success doesn't make it a success. Only scientifically rigorous methods of, of program assessment should be considered when making a decision, not the reliance upon anecdotal evidence by schools declaring that their programs are a success. The best scientific evidence disproves the theory that drug testing reduces illicit drug use among teens. Secondly, there is an economic benefit to those companies that market and drug testing kits and drug testing to show that their tests reduce illicit drug use. Our focus should not be upon anecdotal evidence or a personal economic incentive to show that the testing works, it should be based upon social science. Um, Dr. Gulley, let me ask you, what, um, first of all, what kinds of programs do uh, these other schools, Bayside, Talladega, MBA, et cetera, uh, have? Do they do comprehensive education plus mandatory testing, so similar to what Woodward will be employing? Yes. Um, when speaking with them, what evidence did they provide that uh, their policies, uh, first of all, reduced uh, drug use, and then Second, what evidence did they provide that it was the testing component and not the comprehensive education component that was responsible for any reductions that they reported in their uh, students? Well, uh, to go to Mr. Jackson's first point, I think uh, I agree completely that decisions like this need to be driven by rigorous scientific data. The fact of the matter is, is that it doesn't exist, uh, in, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of the committee, um, given the limitations of the testing that I described uh, earlier. Um, the second thing is, is that in the case of these institutions, uh, they uh, lack also the basis of any uh, scientific data to, to present. But they uh, did, were, were like Woodward, where they had effective, what they believed to be effective education programs before they implemented the drug testing uh, and found that after several years of having the drug, test, drug testing program in place and uh, surveys that they conducted of their students, that uh, the students at least self-reported, as in these other studies that I'm citing were not particularly uh, effective, that there had been some reduction in drug use. Uh, these schools uh, use a variety of testing methods from hair to <laughs> urine, and in some instances they are universally uh, testing their students, meaning that every student in every year is tested in addition to being randomly tested. We decided not to go to that length. Um, I'll ask one more uh, uh, question to each uh, side and then we'll, we'll get some questions from the audience. So on the issue of um, uh, diversion to other experiments, so alcohol consumption, uh, the use of LSD or drugs that are, that are more difficult to test or that uh, don't stay in the system as long, um, are you concerned at all that the, the policy will result in students doing more experimentation with alcohol? Well, we asked that question a lot in our research process, and particularly of these four schools, and they felt that uh, based on the anecdotal rep evidence they had to report from students that there was not any uh, driving of students to other drugs. Now, that said, in urine testing, you can put uh, very advanced screening devices into place that can measure most uh, uh, types of medications or uh, chemicals that students can take from de uh, depressants to stimulants to hallucinogens. Uh, so urine testing and the, and the reason we went with the urine testing over hair testing was because of the broad array of drugs that could be uh, tested. Um, and uh, so we, we feel confident about our ability to capture most of the drugs that would be out there. That then would leave alcohol and uh, as, as students probably are aware, a part of the policy is, is that we are increasing the opportunities for breathalyzing students if we feel like there's reasonable suspicion. A policy that was already in place before we even adopted this one. Uh, Mr. Jackson, can you, can you talk about yeah. uh, the, the issue of alcohol, um, the issue of, of the use of breathalyzers on campus as a deterrent to 
uh, student consumption of alcohol, uh, and how do you uh, feel students will uh, respond in terms of their, their choice of experiments? Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> I, I'll make a, a, a couple of comments first and then I'll get into that. Um, uh, Dr. Gulley mentioned these uh, four schools and he used the word anecdotal evidence, and that's exactly precisely the point that we're trying to make, which is the uh, we're making health dis health decisions at here at Woodward, uh, Woodward Academy based upon anecdotal evidence. It would seem to me that the better best practices would indicate that you make these decisions based upon science, not upon the reported studies of these four s schools giving anecdotal evidence. In addition, I also want to talk about the the, the, the committee that Dr. Gully referred to. Not he mentioned this this committee of 18 people. Um, including business uh, people, DEA agents, uh, members of the governing board and administration. Hmm. Interestingly absent from this analysis of the uh, the committee were uh, members of the uh, uh, of the faculty and even more importantly the student body. This is a teen issue um, in which students um, sub, uh, are, are are bombarded bombarded by peer pressure. Uh, to use drugs and alcohol. It would seem to me that if the teens are in part the ones who create the illicit drug use by impressing themselves upon other teens, then teens should also be part of the solution. Um, now, with respect to the actual use of the, uh, uh, of the drugs and the switch to alcohol, what I would say is this. No testing is going to, uh, whether it be urine or hair analysis, no testing is going to um, detect all the potential drugs that, that teens are going to take. So if the student knows that the, the urine test will test for X, they'll simply switch to Y. Um, in addition, the breathalyzer test um, is used if the, stu if the members of the uh, Woodward Academy uh, faculty or staff have reasonable suspicion that the student is, uh, uh, is using alcohol. Well, how would that apply if a student is is binge drinking on the weekend and not going to a board event. Uh, again, the breathalyzer test, although it's important and it's it's um, at least the way it's currently constructed, is used because there is a reasonable suspicion of alcohol use at this moment. That doesn't deter students from binge drinking on the weekends or on a t or, or during a time period in which the alcohol would leave the body before they were at a Woodward Academy event. And um, so, again, it would seem to me that this supports my theory that the best practices should be the education and the resistance of peer pressure to use drugs and alcohol in the first place and not the threat of reprisals or the use of testings, which, which is driving the current policy today. Um, I'll give you a chance to respond to both those before we do uh, some additional questions. Let's start with the, the committee issue. Um, Mr. Jackson asked about faculty involvement, student involvement. I guess another uh, thing to ask about is, uh, were there any national organizations? Uh, Mr. Jackson cited uh, a host of them, the American Association of Pediatrics, the American Social Workers Association, um, that have opposed drug testing. Did you consider, uh, are there countervailing national organizations that specialize in, in that kind of thing that um, led you to, to support the mandatory uh, part of the program? Uh, and do you feel like the committee was, was representative and uh, w was effective in, in making this decision? Yeah. Well, as Mr. Jackson didn't repeat what I had said earlier, that in addition to the members of the committee were uh, several physicians as well as uh, several attorneys who were much more skilled in understanding the nuances of drug testing and its effectiveness beyond what I as a layperson can understand and who really spent much of their time discussing and trying to get around the nuances of this. Uh, so I think in the end, their research led them to believe that this was indeed uh, the right way to proceed. It is true, uh, you can debate whether or not faculty were on the committee. There were certainly a number of senior administrators, some of whom teach, that were on the committee. There were not students on the committee. Uh, but uh, we don't, uh, if, if you take our honor code, for example, um, the, the uh, research that's out there would suggest that honor codes uh, don't work, but that the honor codes that do work are those that have permeated the culture. That over time, once they become ingrained in the culture, the studies will show that they have, have become effective. And so that's sort of what we're intending here. Um, so I, to my knowledge, we never consulted with students about whether or not we should have an honor code. We don't consult with students about whether or not they should wear uniforms. Uh, so there are certain standards and expectations that uh, we put into place for 
uh, what we value and the principles by which we stand that uh, really are beyond any kind of category of person within the community. Um. Mr. Thume, do you have some questions from the audience that you want to? Uh, yes, uh, we have a number of questions. Uh, I'm going to, obviously we will not get to all of the questions and I've been trying to use uh, the frequently asked questions from the Woodward website to respond to all the students who have asked the questions that are sort of factual, uh, what is this policy questions. Um, a couple of questions uh, for each of you. Um, the first question uh, for Dr. Gully, um, based on, uh, is, is sort of similar to what you've asked, but I guess uh, returns to Woodward's mission statement, which says that given that we're trying to develop critical thinkers and problem solvers, why are we teaching students that we should be basing our major policy decisions on self-interested anecdotes? Um, so I guess that was the first question from yeah. the audience. Well, again, uh, if you're looking for scientific data, there is from the U.S. Department of Education a study released in 2010 that suggests that drug testing does work. So what we have here is scientific data that's in conflict with each other uh, about whether or not uh, it, it works. But the truth is that even that data is based on anecdote because it's all self-reported student information. Um, so at, at, at some point, I think the decision has to be made by the institution, again, weighing all the evidence that is out there, particularly on the impact on brain development as to what additional steps we might take as a community to help protect the uh, health and welfare of our students. And I feel uh, justified that the uh, testing program will, will do that for our students. Uh, there's a follow-up question, I think, about the conflict in science. Um, which is that Woodward Academy employs an outstanding science faculty, including a number of PhDs. Did you consult with any of them in trying to resolve these scientific debates? We did not. Okay. Um, Mr. Jackson. Yes. Uh, uh, several students have asked, uh, if students aren't using drugs, they don't really need to worry about the drug policy. Why should we fight against something that is only going to catch people who are doing something illegal? All right. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's easily to, um, um, rebutted. Uh, like I said before, just because you have the right to do it doesn't make it right to do it. Now, I don't have to uh, be using drugs for my not wanting the intrusion and the and and the taking of my of my personal bodily fluids. Um, um, and so, in, in and a comparison would be I don't have to be selling drugs for my not wanting the, uh, the, the government to be intruding into um, my basement or my closets or whatever. Um, solely because you have the, um, the, the, the right to test doesn't make it right to test. And whether I am using drugs or not, I still don't want that intrusion. Uh, Dr. Gully, a couple of students have asked, uh, given your sort of focus on early drug prevention, um, why is the program not testing the middle schoolers who have the most risk of brain development that you cited? Well, it's, I, I would say that the, the risk is great all the way up to 18, even 21 to 25 years of age. But um, we debated long and hard about whether or not to implement the testing program in grades 7 and 8. We concluded in the final analysis, at least for the short term, that we needed to begin focusing our efforts in an enhanced education effort there where maybe we haven't been doing as much as we could do and also involving the parents in that process as well in a required process that they have to go through uh, starting in the seventh grade to engender conversation between parents and students. Uh, but we are open to the possibility that later on down the road, once we have become subtle in the way we are managing it in the high school, that we might add it uh, in the middle school years. Uh, a number of students have asked a question about uh, sort of the role of students needing to learn to make their own decisions uh, at the high school level. Um, and I think that they sort of referenced uh, uh, Mr. Jackson's argument that the reasons that we learn to say no matters. Would you be willing to speak to that? Um, just sort of the question that if we're teaching kids to say no only because they'll be tested, um, they won't be able to, they won't learn how to say no on their own? Right. Um. I, I understand the, the, uh, the argument. I, again, I think that uh, based on uh, the information that we were dealing with and the concern that we had about how vulnerable students are in settings where uh, there is so much drug activity taking place, that we wanted to err on the side of giving the students the option of being able to say no. Um, one could argue that why do we have an honor code here? Students uh, should be able to be trusted 
that uh, they are going to uh, provide uh, accurate and uh, only their information in an academic environment. They will not lie, cheat, or steal, or use other person's information um, in their academic pursuits. But we have in place an honor code that lays out principles by which we believe that we should operate as a community in the hope that it is going to deter persons who might uh, uh, choose to cheat, but if they do, that there is a consequence associated with it. So I think that analogy applies in this instance with drug testing as well. Uh, so to follow up on the honor uh, question, I'm sort of combining two questions here, but um, the, a, a couple of students have indicated that the honor code only applies to activities at school, um, and given that the drug testing policy looks for things that happen outside of school and that are now legal in several states, um, why is this something that Woodward feels is not overreaching? Uh, well, for one thing, uh, chemicals that you ingest in yourself have a lifespan beyond when you actually take them, other than probably alcohol, which is at more limited duration. So what you do on Saturday night in terms of any drug activity in which you might engage is still with you on Monday and Tuesday. So that, in my, in my opinion, is not an overreach uh, for, for students. I would also like to add, though, however, that the distinction, um, Dr. Gully makes a comparison between uh, the drug testing policy and the article. What I would say is that um, that a comparison is, uh, is inaccurate. Uh, and the reason why I would say that is that um, if you violate the honor code, there is no, um, there is no uh, uh, random mandatory taking of any of your bodily fluids to prove the violation of the code. And so although I see in part, uh, in part the reason why he would want to make, make that comparison, I don't think it applies in this case because there, it, you, you don't have the same um, type of intrusion into your, um, your, your, your person um, in the event of an, of an honor code violation for cheating, for example, as you would um, in, the, in the taking of your hair and your, um, your hair, saliva, or urine. I do think it applies, though, in terms of the point about trust in the community. Um, so whether you're taking a, a, a sample from someone's mind or a sample from uh, their body, um, the issue of trust, I think, does apply in that case. Mr. Jackson, a student yes. asks, if we don't allow the test to be implemented, aren't we basically giving up on students who uh, may be using drugs and might want us to help them? Well, I don't think that's the case. Um, as Dr. Gulley pointed um, before, I think this is really the, 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 this is the point, actually, of our agreement. Uh, between Dr. Gully and myself. Um, the administration, the board, the governing board, teachers, faculty, staff, all right, we don't want necessarily students to be um, high on drugs or drunk on alcohol. We can all agree that um, uh, the better educational environment is one in which um, we are free of, of drugs and alcohol. Um, however, what we, where we disagree is the process by which we achieve that goal. Um, Dr. Gully believes that it's imperative that we have a mandatory random drug testing policy. And what I would say is that uh, the better practice would be for us to have a, um, a well-developed educational program that enables the, the, the students themselves, the teens themselves, that empowers them to say no, not because they're of a threat and reprisals of being expelled if they are caught, but because it's the right thing to do. And so giving, um, uh, not supporting a drug testing policy doesn't mean that I have given up on the students and we've given in to them using drugs. Instead, um, um, instead what it means is that we are trying to achieve the same goal through a different process. Um, we're, we're getting close to out of time here, so um, before I see if Mr. Gadwin has any other questions, I just want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, I've been reading all the Today's Meets questions and answering as many as I could as well, but I just wanted to say that the, the discourse I found to be remarkably civil, um, and uh, I really appreciate all of the students who submitted questions. Um, I hope that you all think I did a relatively okay job of getting a representative sample, but you all asked really good questions, um, and I was very impressed uh, with Woodward as a whole, just based on that. Bill, do you have any final questions? Uh, you, you can ask one more from a student. Uh, okay, well, I can't ask that one. Um, uh, okay, uh, so one question is that given that 
a number of adults, including prominent adults, have admitted to doing the things that we would expel people from Woodward doing, uh, past presidents, uh, et cetera. Um, have you all considered that perhaps these things are not lifelong impacts and that we should sort of let students try and make their own decisions and figure things out, uh, given that most of them do turn out to be okay? If we had the luxury of the uh, potential that uh, a student is not impaired for making decisions that are not the right ones in the teenage years, I would say yes, in an ideal world we would do that. But the fact of the matter is, the science shows that the human brain in the teenage years is not developed to a point where you can rely on that kind of maturity and just hope for the best later on. And so that's the reason, in part, for having this, is to protect students um, for the future. Um, before we do our closing statements, one thing that, that we try to encourage students to do as they learn uh, to debate is to find areas of agreement even when they have uh, disagreements with other people about public policy positions, ethical positions, um, or uh, in this case, uh, education uh, issues. So I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Jackson, what argument that Dr. Gully has made today was most persuasive to you and resonated the most with you? Which argument can you find agreement with, uh, with Dr. Gully? All right, well, uh, I think I've said that point before. The point that um, uh, at the end of the day, what we really want is to um, protect the health, safety, and welfare of the students. And I don't want anyone here to leave um, this debate and think that uh, Mr. Jackson doesn't care about the students. All right, I care immensely about the students. Um, and I think Dr. Gully does as well. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the point of emphasis of our disagreement, however, is, the, is, is really about procedural things and not necessarily the substance of having um, an environment here at Woodward Academy um, that is most conducive to, um, to, to, to uh, learning and development. Dr. Ali, same question for you. What of Mr. Jackson's arguments do you find most uh, persuasive or compelling? I don't know that I could express it any more articulately than he did. Um, I think we are in agreement that we want the very best for our students, particularly on this particular issue and what is the best way to go about doing it. If I thought that our education efforts or a revision of the education efforts would result in um, the, the kind of uh, reduction in risk-taking behavior that Mr. Jackson advocates, um, I would be all for doing that, but we're just not convinced that that, that can be done because we are so um, persuaded by what we have been doing and the enhancements that we have made to the education program here that an additional step like this was important. All right, well, we've got a few minutes left uh, for some closing statements. Um, Dr. Gully, if you want to uh, uh, take the podium and give some closing thoughts about uh, the policy, you, you uh, have the floor. Okay. I, I think I just feel better staying seated. Stay seated. Right. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, I want to thank Mr. Jackson for initiating this and for the obvious care and thought that he's put into researching the matter. He probably didn't have to do a whole lot on it, however, <laughs> because I know of his passion on this topic. And for uh, what I believe to be a very civil and thoughtful exchange that we have had. What I hope today has demonstrated is that on issues like this, there is a lot of gray, that there is not absolute black white where you can uh, say that with 100% certainty that one, one way is the right way versus the other. That at some point, eventually, an organization or people in leadership roles have to take the best evidence and information that they have and make the decision that they feel is in the best interest of their community, which is what I believe we have attempted to do here. Uh, so my willingness to participate in this was both because I felt like you as students deserved the opportunity to hear this exchange, though we did have an opportunity with you in the fall to have this kind of conversation, but not in quite this way. <laughs> uh, and secondly, because I have great respect for our debate program, its long and proud history and its excellent leadership and Mrs. Berthiem and Mr. Batterman. Uh, we talk about Woodward being a national model in college preparatory education, and one area where we're doing it is in our debate program. So what I hope that you have witnessed today is not only how important topics can be civilly debated, but that debate <coughs> itself might be something that would appeal to you and that you might engage your energies in. When I look back on my life and what I'm doing today and what has had probably the most profound impact on me and what I do today, it was participating in debate in high school. 
forensics in high school, extemporaneous speaking, and doing debate had a tremendous impact on me, and I, I fall back on those skills every single day of my life. And so I know the program would welcome additional participation on the part of you. It's a, it's a tough road to go, and it's a lot of effort, but I think the uh, effort in the end is worth it. Mr. Jackson. All right, well, thank you very much. I also want to thank everyone who, um, who, uh, who came out today. Um, uh, interesting uh, enough how we started off with a fire drill <laughs> um, and then the, uh, the the subsequent stampede I almost didn't make it to the debate um, um, because of the interest that the uh, students had to be here um, in the math science lecture hall to get a first-hand look um, what I would say um, in closing is that Dr. Gully and I we disagree about the process by which to achieve the goal um, he believes that the, uh, that the program will, will, uh, will prevent drug and alcohol use, and um, although I disagree with that, um, I, I, I pray that actually that I am, I, that I am incorrect in that, in that, in that assessment. Um, uh, he also says we don't wish to punish. Um, however, I, I must say it seems like to me that there is a, there is a certain punishment reprisals, especially if you consider that after second field drug test, there is consequences for your actions. Um, uh, he also thinks that the policy believe, uh, encourages students to say no, and my fear is that we will have, um, that after all is said and done, um, much will have been said about this drug testing policy, uh, deterring drug and alcohol use, but little will have been done to actually deter drug and alcohol use. Um, and, and again, I pray that I pray that at the end of the day, um, um, I am wrong. Uh, I am a, I am not an advocate for teens using drugs and alcohol. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I am, but I am a, a, an advocate for uh, the best practices and the policies which um, a, a, a achieve the, the goal that both Dr. Gully and I can agree upon. Now, I also want to uh, thank Dr. Gully um, again for um, agreeing to this debate. Clearly, he could have simply, from you know, his tower, just gave an edict and said, we're doing this policy, end of discussion. Um, however, when I went in to talk to him about a different debate, um, we had gotten to a discussion and he was open to the possibility of, of in a public policy forum debate, debating this uh, very issue. He could have clearly hit under his desk and um, he didn't, and that shows um, how much of a national model Woodward is trying to achieve. Um, so thank every, I want to, in closing, I want to thank all of you all because you all make this thing happen. I want to thank our debate coaches, um, Mr. Bader, Mr. Perthume, um, for their assistance, and um, I want to thank um, Dr. Gully for uh, giving me the opportunity um, to advocate uh, a position um, that uh, many students b uh, uh, believe in um, and that perhaps um, uh, Mr. Gold doesn't believe in, but we, we, we do agree on the one thing, and that is, that is the, 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 uh, an environment in which you all become the, uh, the, the best educated, the best learner, the best developed students you possibly can be is better for all of society. Thank you.